Tony Blair and Gordon Brown, again, were two individuals who believed in laissez-faire capitalism, light touch regulation, and uh, again, this allowed the City of London to get bigger and bigger, and to, to grow and grow, and um, lead us to where we are now, uh, with uh, a Labour Party who uh, were involved with the uh, economic uh, crisis in the sense that they were working for Gordon Brown at the time. So have they really got the answers uh, to put it right at, at the moment uh, and in the future, maybe they should think about changing policy a little bit. So, in 2008, with the financial crisis and all the fallout after that, all of these banks needed to be bailed out. Had they not been bailed out, they would have been bust, they would have been insolvent. Okay? Now, I don't know what other industry would um, bail out this many uh, corporations, and we're going to be looking about why these uh, banks are given this, this privilege, so that even when they do go bust and uh, don't run their businesses properly, that the taxpayer is there to bail them out. Uh, it is, had we let these banks fail, it probably would have uh, cost the taxpayer more in the long run, but we'll get on to that in a little bit more detail in a second. So the, the situation uh, at the moment is um, one where the uh, coalition government have uh, taken on the strategy of austerity combined with quantitative easing. Now, the quantitative easing at the moment is to the tune of £375 billion, and this has been uh, largely pumped into the financial sector. Um, it's been um, sloshed around into the markets, and unfortunately, um, this has um, been uh, extracted by people at the, at the top of the pyramid rather than being evenly distributed around the whole of the economy. Uh, had the government have decided that that 375 billion would have been better spent on building schools, hospitals, infrastructure, then we might be in a slightly different situation to what we are now. But effectively, uh, we are held hostage by the bond markets because we cannot allow them to fail. So there's some serious problems uh, that we're looking at. Uh, another one that um, was put in place by the Labour government was the uh, Deposit Guarantee Scheme, which meant that £85,000 of um, depositors money was guaranteed by the government. So even if these uh, banks experience runs on the bank, they, um, their money would be safe, the government would reimburse them for that money. The problem with this is... Sorry, what's that called again? It's called the Depositors Guarantee Scheme. Uh, I think there is another name for it, that, but that is what it's commonly known as. So that's to the tune of £85,000. But as long as people's money was safe, if you were lucky enough to have £85,000 in it, then uh, you're not actually bothered about what your bank gets up to. Uh, the general theory is that if you don't have this uh, guarantee there, then you're going to be scrutinising what your bank is doing, who they are lending to, uh, what they're invested in, all, all of these sort of things. So effectively, putting that guarantee there is safeguarding banks, allowing them to do risky, unethical behaviour, and this is something which needs to seriously be looked at. Um, <clears throat> there, there is a danger of, uh, of bank runs, but these bank runs often start from uh, rumours, and often these rumours are actually quite well founded. So if you look at uh, what led up to the economic crisis, it was subprime lending, where you had um, uh, banks going for quantity of loans rather than quality of loans. It was incentivized for them to make more and more loans because this made, meant more and more profit. The, the, large, the more loans that were made, the greater the assets of the bank. This is an important issue to realize that any loans that we take from banks become their assets. So who is to blame? Is it uh, Osama bin Laden and the, the war on terror, or whistleblowers like uh, Bradley Manning, or is, is it people who are uh, on, on the dole or, or disability, who the, the coalition would uh, like us to think of as uh, skivers and, and scroungers? Or is there truth actually that maybe, rather than being any individual bank or any individual bankers, it is the banking system which is uh, largely uh, at the root of our, uh, our public debt, our, our private debt as well. Um, <clears throat> so um, I'm not saying that uh, a lot of the, the bank, individual bankers at the time conducted themselves um, very well. There was 
We know there was examples of mis-selling, uh, the LIBOR scandal, where they were um, putting forward um, made-up uh, interest rates, all of these sort of things. It's, it's a form of, of legalised fraud, effectively. They were scamming people to be able to make more profits for themselves. They were bending the rules, probably you know, crossing the line of the law at, at some point or another, but they've never been held to account. Instead, we moved into this era of austerity where people are quick to blame, um, various other people, but not really looking at the bankers and saying, either we need to change the system, or some of these people uh, need to, you know, being caught uh, upon charges of some kind. Um, so the, the reason I'm here today really is to tell you about a little bit about a campaign called Positive Money. They've done some excellent research. They've published uh, two books, Where Does Money Come From? and Modernizing Money. I would recommend them. They're available on Amazon or through the Positive Money website for £15 each. Uh, and it really talks about how money has changed through the ages, how we've moved from coins to notes, and really, since 1999, under the noughties, we've moved into a period of, of digitised money, or digitised debt, in fact. 97% of, uh, of loans are, uh, of 97% of money is issued by banks as loans, so this is our debt. 97% of money in the economy is debt. It's, it's digital. It's just numbers, it's just code in the computer screen. Only 3% of it is coins and notes. And only that coins and notes is what doesn't have any debt attached to it. Everything else is a win-lose game. For somebody to be in credit, somebody else has to be in debt by an equal amount. At the end of the day, it all has to level out, uh, even out. But we're going to see why it can never even out in this current system. So, um, these are some uh, graphs here from the money that was created by banks in the way that I'm describing over these years and we can see it was getting uh, larger and larger through the 2000s and peaking in 2008 with 266 billion pounds of new money being created and remember that 92 percent of this money was pumped into the investment sector being stocks and shares or uh, real estate pushing up prices quite quite artificially effectively it wasn't adding any value to the system we hadn't increased our productivity in any way it's just numbers so when people talk about house prices going up, the devaluation of currency, I think people have to look at this and see that this is one of the main reasons why. From the time when the Bank of England was formed in 1694, it took just over 300 years for banks to create the first trillion, it took only eight years to create the second trillion pounds. Now that's quite fantastic when you think about it, really. Higher taxes are needed to pay down government debt, this is basically what austerity means. Democracy has been eroded with banks able to steer investment. If you think about where, where the control is, is, is it with the, the money or is it with the passing of laws? And if it's with the passing of laws, then maybe they should look about reforming this system. Pursuit of financial profit at the expense of the environment is extremely damaging. There's no way that Wales can fulfil its commitment to sustainability under a debt-based system. Some uh, expert witnesses uh, here. We've got uh, Mervyn King, the outgoing uh, governor of the Bank of England. He says it plain and simple there when, when he came to, um, to Cardiff last, last year. Um, he, he talks a lot of sense. If, if you look at some, some of the quotes from him, he's quite open about the way that banks create money. And he also uh, calls the banking bailouts the greatest uh, moral hazard in uh, recent times. So, I mean, if this is the, the governor of the Bank of England saying all this, then I think a lot more people should start, start paying attention to what's going on. Uh, this is Martin Wolf, the chief editor of the uh, Financial Times. The essence of contemporary money system is the creation of money out of nothing by private banks, often foolish lending. Now, this foolish lending is what caused the subprime mortgage crisis. It was all these toxic loans where they were trying to sell, sell, sell. It was a sales culture inspired by greed and short-term profits, and people thought that they would be able to get away from it. The reality is that uh, now people like Positive Money, the New Economics Foundation, and various other groups out there online and meeting up around the country are trying to do something about it. Our money supply has effectively been privatised, but well, we've got to ask if this is a democratic system. 
80 bankers and more spending powers at 650 MPs. So, over the five banks, we've got 80 directors on those five boards. They control approximately 85 to 90 percent of the money supply, with a very small amount being um, taken up by government, mutuals, credit unions, and everything. These five high street banks, they have so much control. And uh, yeah, I think there's going to be more coming out in, in, in the future uh, in the media. So pay attention to, to what's going on. And um, yeah, I think there's, there's an opportunity here for people to educate themselves and to really hold the banking system to account. This means our politicians, it means the regulators, and it means the banks. There's a revolving door. You get examples of people like Tony Blair, who as soon as he leaves his position as Prime Minister, he moves to JP Morgan, one of the biggest banks in the world, uh, popped in a, a very, very large salary. Um, this, this slide here really explains why, into the current system, even if we use all the money in the system, we would never be able to pay off that debt. Because when a loan is made, there's the principal, the original loan, this is what goes into the asset sheets on the bank's um, double ledgers, uh, the interest upon that principal actually goes on a different sheet. That goes on the profit and loss sheet for these banks. So they convert the argument. They, they turn things around in all these different ways. And they allow themselves to be able to charge interest upon debt, which they create out of nothing. And uh, yeah, there's, there's some big problems here. For any one person not to have enough money is rational, but for an entire economy constantly not to have enough money, and thereby prevent it from doing what it is clearly capable of doing, is totally absurd. That is from uh, Michael Robotham, and there's another quote from him here. The rea reality will show that there is not and never can be under the debt finance system enough money to pay off the debts. The Grip of Debt is a fantastic book. I would recommend anybody checking if they can get a copy from their library. It is assumed by everyone, and clearly by economists, that money is a neutral and accurate medium. That money does no more than reflect the economic facts. The truth is that, that money is far from neutral. It's become a, a private commodity. And uh, yeah, there's, um, we've got uh, Gordon uh, Os Osborne here, George Osborne here even. When plunder becomes a way of life for a group of men living together in society, they create for themselves in the course of time a legal system that authorizes it and a moral code that glorifies it. And this is very, very true. This is what, what we've, we've come to understand. Bankers earn huge bonuses, between one and five million pounds a year, but we, we accept that, that they, they've earned it. They, they've done a good job, have they really? I think people really need to consider whether uh, greed is, and, and growth as well, whether these two, two issues is something that uh, we want to uh, retain in our, our system, the economy going forward, or do we want to have a cultural shift where we move away from this and we change our values. The greed of gain has no time or limit to its capaciousness. Its one object is to produce and consume. It has pity neither for beautiful nature nor for living human beings. It is ruthlessly ready, without a moment's hesitation, to crush beauty and life. And isn't, isn't this true? The, the fact is that... The, uh, pardon me. Um, the trouble is that economic growth is an abstraction from the underlying human activity that creates it. You can make money from money, as the City of London demonstrates every day. That obscures the relationship between the economy and the environment and suggests that the economy somehow transcends the natural world and it can therefore can continue indefinitely. That's true in theory, but in practice, economic growth and ecological impact are still tightly bound together, particularly in relation to CO2 emissions. The GDP, the gross, gross domestic product, measures with more debt. If you think about the logic of that, it is totally insane. The current government are trying to um, pay down the deficit, but their strategy is not working. The deficit is staying around about where it is. There's different figures. Some people say it's falling. Some people say it's growing slightly. The problem is the system. We cannot rely on growth to be able to, or debt to be able to finance our growth. We need to look at alternatives there. Again, we've got a great quote from uh, J.K. Galbraith, and one from Joseph Stiglitz. Now, Joseph Stiglitz is a great proponent of the genuine progress indicator, which is an alternative to the gross domestic product and measures well-being and happiness in the economy. We're not saying we need to totally disregard GDP. There is a place to understand economics, 
but not when it ignores the, the triple bottom line of, of people uh, and the planet as well. We need a, a more rounded system that takes all these things into account. Uh, when all money is created by banks making loans, it's impossible for the public as a whole to stay out of debt. If you manage to stay out of debt, it means someone else has to sink further under the water in order to maintain the money supply. In other words, debt is not a choice. But how, how is that? Money is a necessity. It is a need. It is a vital utility in the economy. So why do, are we um, forced to go into debt and allow the banks to charge an interest upon that money that they create out of nothing? So the graph here uh, shows the, the net debt in the economy uh, and what it is um, after the financial service intervention, that being the culmination of the bank bailouts, uh, the um, quantitative easing, and other subsidies which are given to the, to the banks through the privilege to create money. It's impossible into the current economy to have less debt and more money. This is pure and simple why this is a totally unsustainable monetary system. Positive money recommends the uh, uh, probably the um, updating of the legislation to uh, account for updates in technology. Since we've had the digitalization of debt, since we've had the internet, all of these different things, the law has not been updated. I think it is time now to consider changing the law so even uh, money from debt, digital um, credits, uh, digital money, uh, this should be uh, forced to go through through the state uh, and um, yeah, stop the banks from having, having that privilege. So the current system you may have heard is called fractional reserve banking. I'm sure you've all heard a little bit about, about that phrase before and you can watch um, uh, YouTube videos uh, and the like about it. The, the fact is that the productive economy is not served by fractional reserve banking. Fractional reserve banking is chasing short-term gains, massive profits for its shareholders. It is not going to invest into the real economy of manufacturing, of public services, of infrastructure. All of these different things, there's not enough profit in them for the banks. Under the fractional reserve system, those things are unlikely to happen, as it is at the moment. Ian's going to talk a little bit, a bit more about how fractional reserve banking could work in the public banking system. But under the current model, there's no quotas or regulation to say the banks need to lend a certain amount of money to the small and medium enterprises, to industry, basically to the productive or real economy. The financial services has become a shadow economy, a spectre which sort of looms over all of us. And it, it is holding us hostage. The truth is, it is actually sucking us dry. And unless people make themselves aware of how the system works, it's going to be very, very difficult to, to change it and, and remove ourselves from, from this bondage that we find ourselves in. So, uh, many of the, um, the, the religions go going back to ancient times, because remember, money in some form or another, it's been around 5,000 years. There's been lots of times where empires have fallen because of money. You think about Rome, that is a prime example, but there's other examples that you can find as well. Now, what used to happen in, in a lot of societies would be after 50 years, they would have a, a debt jubilee, so that all debts would be cancelled. Perhaps it, this is uh, an option which the UK could, uh, could consider, and there's various people around the internet advising that, that sort of thing. Basically, the current system, it causes all these problems. We give this privilege to the banks, we're giving them power to control our money and, and steer our co economy in certain directions. Um, there's, there's campaigns out there. Desmond Tutu, for example, he started the divestment uh, uh, campaign, which is about trying to get banks to withdraw their investment from uh, development of nuclear arms. There's plenty of these things out there, but people need to educate themselves. They need to understand how the system works, and then we can finally do something about it. So <clears throat> where do the words wealth and value come from? They, they don't come from anything to do with uh, to money or um, getting one over on your neighbour, competition, anything like this. It's about endurance, it's about durability, it's about preserving what, what we have. You know, uh, this, this, this great word from uh, Aristotle, chromastetics. And, and that's true. We, in, in the UK, particularly in the city of London, we've got very good at making money from money. 
but without adding any productive value to it, without adding any capacity. We need to change this system, and it is possible. We allow this system to happen, we consent to this system, we can change it. So this is the last slide you'll be glad to hear. So the, um, this great book by Nicholas Shackleton, which uh, points out that in offshore tax havens, there's 21 trillion pound out there. Where has that 21 trillion pound come from? It's been extracted from all the economies around the world. So we need to think about closing these tax havens and reappropriating this money and redistributing it around the world into positive campaigns. There's lots of different things that we can do, but all you've got to do is remember is that money is a relationship between equals, between a lender and a borrower. It's not about us being down here and being subservient to the banks. That is not how this system works at all. We need a system that is holistic, that, that thinks about systems thinking, that is, uh, um, that is able to circulate credit where it is needed and recognises as money as a form of equity, as a form of trust between one person and another. Thank you very much. into their uh, investment arms and their essential banking arms. So with high street banks, people want to be able to keep their, their wages in them, they want to be able to save, and they want to be able to draw upon that money. What we've got at the moment is all of these systems are mixed up together, so the banks can effectively uh, use our, our deposits or our cumulative loans to speculate upon. Now, if we split those up, as it used to be uh, before 1999, then we would be able to have a system where um, the investment banks didn't have quite so much leverage. They would have to you know, be a lot more careful about the investments that they were making. So I, I think that, that would be absolutely uh, correct to say that we need to uh, separate central banking and investment banking and have transaction-based accounts and investment-based accounts. Uh, on, on the first question, I'll, I'll use the example of the, the Royal Bank of Scotland. Um, the cost of our, our bailout to them, uh, to buy, a, a, I think it's an 83% share that the, the taxpayer has in RBS, it cost us uh, 45 and a half billion pounds. Were we to have let them fail, because they were so heavily involved in the bond market, and that all the bond markets around the world were all linked together, and um, a lot of those bonds would have been held by other banks, and this sort of thing, the estimate that I've read is 800 billion pounds which would have been the cost to the whole economy uh, of the, the loss of uh, the Royal Bank of Scotland. Some people would say, well, they, they should have failed, and anybody who was silly enough to get involved in that subprime mortgage uh, angle um, should be, should be yeah, pulled, pulled out of there and uh, not allowed to do that. Uh, we'll take another couple of quick questions, but I know Ian wants to get on. That bill yes. society can go back to what they used to do, because people say that when it was changed, they're not the same beasts as they were before. They were. Absolutely. I, I think there's a good case for, for mutuals. Uh, Principality is a great example in, in Wales. Uh, and I think the demutualisation, a lot of the bills in societies, was a serious problem. Again, it sort of gave over into this greed culture. And it's, it's that culture which we really need to change. We need to stop. Um, what, wanting to buy things now that we can't afford and think that we'll pay for them in the future. All of this debt is, is our children who we are, are effectively putting into debt. So, yeah, that, that is definitely something that, that should be addressed. And, and mutuals, credit unions, cooperatives, uh, all something that should be uh, more and more important in the future. Problems which at the moment are in this system. I'm going to start with quotation. It's a fairly long quotation, we're going to read it out. And what I'd like you to do is, as I'm reading this, can you maybe think who might have said this? The great monopoly in this country is the money monopoly. So long as that exists, our own variety and freedom and individual energy of development are out of the question. A great industrial nation is controlled by its system of credit. Our system of credit is concentrated. 
The growth of the nation therefore and all our activities are in the hands of a few men who, even if their actions be honest and intended for the public interest, are necessarily concentrated upon the great undertakings in which their own money is involved and who necessarily, by every reason of their own limitations, chill and check and destroy genuine economic freedom. This is the greatest question of all, and to this, statesmen must address themselves with an earnest determination to serve the long future and the true liberties of men. Any guesses who might have said that? Abraham Lincoln? It's not Abraham Lincoln, it's actually more recent. Galbraith. It's not Galbraith. Uh, Frank uh, uh, Roosevelt. It's not Roosevelt. Might be a bit of a surprise. It was actually this man. It's Woodrow Wilson, who was the president who actually ended up instituting the uh, Federal Reserve System. But, I mean, just to show you really there, sometimes these problems are presented to us as if they are novelties. Mm -hmm. The crisis that happened is presented to us as a black swan. <coughs> something that's came out of nowhere. We didn't see it ca coming. Unfortunately, that is the biggest lie being told. These crises have happened time and time again for the same reason. If, if you look at the date there on Woodrow Wilson's quotation, he was saying this in 1911. You can go back 100 years before that and find somebody else saying it. You can find it in Adam Smith, who, by the way, you meant to worship and not read, as Noam Chomsky says. You can actually read it, it's very critical of all this stuff. Not that I'm a great believer. Because I think he had a lot of things just basically wrong. But another quotation there, which won't go through the whole thing, and this was from the crucial committee, the same period, which was set up to look into the power of the money trusts, as they were called now. And they're still the same organizations. If you go into the rest of that piece there by Wilson, he's talking about the Citibank. He's talking about JP Morgan. He's talking about all the banks that we still have there, Kuhn and Lowe. All the banks are still the same essential organization. It's far more dangerous than all that has happened to us in the past is, the, is in the way of elimination of competition in industry, is the control of credit through the domination of these groups over our banks and industries. Whether under a different currency system the resource of our banks will be greater or less is comparatively immaterial if they continue to be controlled by a small group. The arteries of credit now clogged, well nigh to choking by the obstructions created through the control of these groups are open so that they may be permitted freely to play their important part in the financial system. Competition in large enterprises will become possible and businesses can be conducted on its merits instead of being subject to the tribute and the goodwill of this handful of self-constituted trustees of national property. It's almost inconceivable that a government committee would come up with something that strong these days, which I think is deeply disturbing. That we go back a hundred years and you know find <coughs> people who are hardly radicals in their own people <coughs> coming up with something this strong, yet that seems to be lacking from our central government system, and that's something that we want to look at. Now, I would say that what I'm going to argue here is that obviously a credit system, well, I don't think anyway, the credit system is natural. Is something that goes back a long, long way. I think it goes back before money, perfectly honestly. That if you read the anthropologists, all the suggestions are that we had credit systems before we had monetary systems, per se. And credit, in my view, and the view of a lot of other economic thinkers, is of itself neither good nor bad. I, what I'll argue here, really, and the, the, the central point of what I'll be saying tonight, is that the real issue is who issues that credit and who do they issue it to? and for what purpose. Those are the things that I think we can start remedying the problems in the system by looking at. The issue that I'm going to look at really is, is public banking. Um, just to explain to you what a, a, a public bank is, I'll just get onto that first. A public bank is essentially a bank that is owned by uh, a government, it could be a state government, it could be a local authority, it could be any level of government, but essentially the, the base of that bank, the depository base of that bank, will be the revenue of that government. At the moment, what our local government does, and what our other uh, uh, levels of government do, is to place that money in private banks. So this is what currently happens at a, a, a local government level. 
Okay? This is adop ad um, adapted from an, an American model by the Public Banking Institute. And the same thing essentially happens here. What you can see is that basically here's the, the taxpayer paying their, their local tax to the, uh, the local government. That government's then going to put their money into these banks in the city who are then going to do what they do with it, which tends to be speculative activity. They're not going to invest. They're not going to look at the real economy. They're going to do the activities that they currently do. There's going to be profits with the profits and the money there feed back into the bank. So in other words, I mean, how do banks make their money? It's, it's the spread. It's the difference between they, they create money for nothing or borrow it at currently 0.95% and they lend it at whatever rate, frankly, they can get. And that spread is where they get their money. And that's why banks have got the biggest buildings in any town you'll ever go to. In this system, that feeds back into the bank. The bank might use that for further speculation. The bank might use that for further lending. Where it's not going, it's back to the taxpayer or back to the government. They may have a modest return, as we all do, on any savings that, that we hold with them. Now, under the public banking system, this is how it looks. And what we've got there basically is a system whereby the state bank here is essentially owned by the government. It's a separate corporation to the government. Decisions are made by politicians, and I'll go into that in much more detail in a minute. But what we have here is a bank which has a mission statement and an ethos to invest in real production. It could be in infrastructure, particularly green infrastructure. These are the type of things we need to invest in at the moment that banks are not investing in. And the, this will actually, as you can see here, this will create jobs. And what actually the, the really important thing here is that spread, which is currently going out in bank bonuses or disappearing offshore, feeds back into the system, is paid back to the government who are the sole shareholder. So you're not looking to sell huge amounts of loan volume so you can get those big bonuses and it's not all about shareholder value but the shareholder is the government so the profits that are made on these productive loans come back to the government itself now this is no wild theoretical idea this is something that 40 percent of banks in the world already do okay so this it, it's only alien to us in britain okay um, I'll have a little look at that in a minute. Now, one of the places where it's very, very common to find public banking is in the BRIC countries, so Brazil, Russia, India, China. And you can see the, the growth that happens there because of the way their system works. Now, I also agree that I don't think we should be looking at um, a financial system that's just about growth. We don't want to just to be producing, producing, shopping, shopping. That's not the idea either. But the fact is that the need to keep producing on this enormous scale, a lot of it is because we are, if you like, the, the value is being extracted from our economy through the pay of interest to private corporations. It's one of the reasons that we need to keep fueling this growth fire. Now, it's a quick case study of a public bank. This was in Canada. The Canadian government from 1939 to 1974 had a, a public bank and they borrowed from that bank of Canada effectively interest free. Same thing happened in Australia, the Commonwealth Bank of Australia. Uh, and the major government projects were funded in this way without increasing the debt. So things like aircraft production in World War II, all right, these are purposes we might thoroughly disagree with. But nonetheless, all of these type of projects, education benefits, returning soldiers, family allowances, all the pensions, Trans-Canada Highway, St. Lawrence Seabury Project, Universal Healthcare, all of these things were partly at least funded by the ability of the government to borrow from the central state's own bank. What happened after 1974? Canada joined the um, Bank of International Settlements and the, Basel and the Basel Committee, which frowned on these practices, calling them inflationary. They were, by the way. Um, Canada's now embroiled in debt, and the same process happened in Australia and New Zealand. There's, there's Canada's national debt, and there's the point at which they joined the Bank of International Settlements. So there's a fairly stark uh, 
lesson there about um, the benefits of some kind of public bank and the problems of throwing yourself on the mercy of the bond market and its vigilantes. Okay, so what is a public bank? Just recap that. It's an important question because we don't have them in the UK. As I say, it's a, it's a bank that's either owned by any, it, that is owned by any level of government. That's, that's, that's the very basic definition. Now, from that I have to exclude RBS, Lloyds and Northern Rock, the, the, the bailed out banks. We own them, but they do not operate as public banks. They continue to operate exactly the same models that they operated previously. So we basically just kind of funded their party. That's all we've done. Without making them the useful entities they could be. Now it's not impossible that we could do that, although the way the government's talking at the moment, we're going to have another sort of tell Sid campaign and we're all going to be invited to buy the bank we already own, RBS. So another contract is going to be played on us, whereas that could be broken into regional public banks. It could happen, but it isn't going to happen, unfortunately. It's not my decision to exclude these bodies, and um, that's also the position of the European Association of Public Banks. They also say, no, no, in the way that we define it, these are, these are not public banks. You can't look at them that way, they don't fulfill that function. There's a general lack of understanding about this. I spoke to 1AM who thought that the bailout bank were public banks. In fact, he kind of wrote, wrote me quite a kind of stern email. Did you know we already have public banks? We own these banks. And I had to write back to him and explain in detail that no, these are not public banks in the sense that I'm trying to talk to you about them. Um, and he also believed that they would be lending public money. Now, as um, Justin did explain to some degree, how banks work essentially, um, and how that money is created, he talked a little bit about banks creating money. What banks do through fractional reserve lending is to essentially they have the ability to lend multiples of their deposit base. What that means is if a bank holds £100, if it's operating on a reserve ratio of 10 to 1, from that £100 it can lend £1,000. <coughs> so now you, you see why the banks have got the biggest buildings in town. That's a wonderful facility to have. There's no reason why a public bank shouldn't have exactly that facility. And in that sense, there'd be nothing wrong with that credit facility if it was being used for a positive purpose and the spread of those loans has been recapped, uh, so recouped, sorry, for the use of, uh, of the good of society. This is now stuck. Give me a moment, sorry. Oh, what's happened to this? Is it water? Uh, no, it's not. It's nice. It's the computer. Sorry, bro. Okay. So, as we have uh, said, it's a bank owned by the state or government, it uses a tax base as its depository base, lends to productive economy or infrastructure, recoups the profits, the spread as it's called from loans with public owners. Really importantly here, I think in any kind of public bank, no perverse incentivization. And what I mean by that is no pressure to maximize shareholder value or to earn um, bonuses just by creating more and more loans. And that's how our banks currently work, essentially. So that's why we've ended up really here, as Justin kind of explained, in the situation we are, because we do have this perverse incentivization, which is also combined with what really is de facto deregulation, in the sense that we do. Even if there are laws to prevent things happening, they're not enforced. We have regulatory bodies that are asleep at the wheel, frankly. Okay, so where we might we find public banks? Um, every nation in the world except the UK, Lithuania, and Cyprus. So we're in good company in not having public banks, because obviously the Lithuanian economy is absolutely booming. Um, and we all know that the, the Cypriot banks, I think, at this stage, is that terrifying aspect of uh, the bailings, which I'm going to talk about in a second as well. Uh, formerly we funded in Australia, the Commonwealth Bank of Australia. Um, and a really important model can be found in the Bank of North Dakota in America. It might be quite surprising that in you know, the land of free enterprise we find one of these public banks but there's a really successful public bank in North Dakota that was set up in 1919 as part of the uh, populist movement. Like a lot of uh, great changes in society, it was set up by angry farmers um, who basically decided that they wanted their own credit system to protect them from the, the Wall Street banks who were foreclosing on their farms and 
essentially making it almost impossible to, to conduct their, their business. Uh, and also, as I mentioned, the BRIC countries are really wrong. But also we've got things like the German system of Sparkassen and Landes banks. And what that is, again, is a network of, um, not strictly publicly owned this time, but they are chartered public institutions in the sense that um, they are given a public mission. Uh, the idea of the Sparkassen and the Landes Bank, again, is that they will invest in their own geographical areas um, and they also uh, are, are tasked with investing in the real economy. Not, not in speculation, not in any of, of that kind of um, casino banking, if you like. Uh, a couple of the Landes Banks, the most, doit, most notably West Deutsche Landes Bank and Bayerische Landes Bank, you may have heard of those, they incorporated and behaved like uh, private banks and consequently they had to be bailed out for billions by the German state. Those who continued with their boring, traditional banking model are absolutely fine. They, they've weathered the crisis, they've been able to lend in fact and kind of cyclically when all the other banks are, uh, banks are contracting their credit, these banks have been able to continue to provide credit to their clients, to their customers, because they know them and they trust them and they're able to do that and to continue that through a process like this. What about Iceland? Hmm? What about Iceland? Are you talking about the Landis Banking? Big, big, the big bank frauds. Those were initially public banks that incorporated and again, like nuclear uh, during that period, they, they, they're now instituting or attempting to institute public banks again. That's, that's what's happening there again. But those were all public banks. Successful, not very um, interesting, which quite frankly I think banking shouldn't be. Um, they kind of went on an even keel, lending to you know, the agricultural economy and, the, and, and their local businesses. That's what they did. Then they incorporated and started borrowing money from everywhere, essentially, um, and got involved in subprime and everything else that every other bank did. And we know what happened, essentially. So, what about, because we used to have the National Gyro Bank. We did. That was a public bank, wasn't it? To some degree, but it's, um, it's not, well, it doesn't, it doesn't fulfill that function anymore. No, no. Can, can I get to the end of, and then I'll, I'll take questions of everybody. Um, now then, if we were to have a public banking rate, which is something that um, kind of I think should be looked at very closely, uh, it, it's important to kind of understand what uh, form that might take. First of all, you have to look at the question of the deposit base of the bank, which is the essential thing, because you need um, a certain amount of money as a deposit base just to charge a bank, just more than one. We can't just write off today and say, you know, dear Mr. Head of the Bank of England, I would like to start a bank. They're going to ask you, well, where's your depository base? For the Welsh Government, um, if they were going to use a tax base, they would need the devolution of taxation, which is actually something that's recommended by the Sub Commission 2012. So if Wales could have control of some of its tax base, that could be used by the Welsh Government as a whole, if that was to be the unit on which it was built. Local authorities obviously have control of their own income, and almost all of them have got enough uh, capital flowing through they assist them to institute the bank themselves. Almost any given local property has got enough moving through the system to do that. Uh, higher education institutions, some of those have got huge endowments of money. Cardiff is one of the biggest, Cardiff University has got one of the biggest investment funds in the country. I'm surprised you don't know. It's University also. Um, unions, pension funds, and then things like the saving model that the general bank used to be. And that's what the Sparkassen and Landis Bank are, are essentially. Mm -hmm. What you've got is a local system, and it, it kind of works bottom up, if you like. People think of the Landis Bank and the Sparkassen, but they don't. The Sparkassen and the Landis Banks. Um, so and that's another possible way that, that you, could, you could get that depository base. And the structure and purpose of, of a bank like that, there's lots of different forms that a public bank can take, lots of different purposes, um, provide a model of um, ethical operation and good corporate governance. This, this could be a bank which isn't run like a casino or an organised crime organisation, which unfortunately our international bank currently are. Um, and I think something that should help to re-envisage banks as public utilities. 
and to re-envisage re a, a credit system as being something which should serve the society at large, serve the Commonwealth, to use a kind of, you know, free boy, free woman, John Bill <coughs> Burns sort of phrase. Um, that that's what a credit system could do as well. Um, the importance of an ethos of, of, of public service to a potential bank, I think, should be quite central to it. It's something that if you look at the Bank of North Dakota and read any interviews with the chief executive for, that he, he's kind of uh, very um, proud, if you like, of the, the tradition that bank has got in that it sees itself as it, its mission of being to serve the people of North Dakota. That's what it does. Um, they don't get bonuses, they get well paid, you know, in, in commensurate with the civil service or professional, but what they see the purpose of their bank as being is completely different, I think, to how banks see themselves now. I think that could be key, introducing that type of ethos could be key to reforming this criminogenic banking system, and that's a, that's a key word really that we've, we've got. What we actually have is a banking system, it's, it, it's a term of criminology, that essentially means an environment that encourages crime, almost guarantees crime. Because if you don't have regulation, and you have incentives that incentivize you to commit crime, funny enough people commit crime. That's what happens. Um, so really, this would hopefully be something where a different si system could lead to a different culture. I mean, to go back to the, the kind of Marxist idea, this is like looking at base and superstructure. What are the kind of relations of production that underlie this system, and what culture will it produce? If your underlying system is one of, if you like, sort of rapacity and greed, well, it will produce a culture that is rapacious and greedy. It's what happened. Um, I mean, that's really it for me. I just wanted to give a really brief overview of that idea of public banking. Um, and hopefully, I'll be able to um, answer any questions that you have. So, uh, thanks very much for, for listening to that. There's this kind of complacency, I think, about, or has been, I'm not sure there is anymore, in some local authorities that, you know, oh, it's safe in the bank. Well, I think Cyprus will teach us that that's not the case. And if we were to look at the uh, joint document produced by the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation of the Bank of England for December 2012, what happened in Iceland, it's now been suggested, is exactly what happened here. Now, some of us have an immediate reaction to, oh, if you've got more than £250,000, then you should have your money taken. Well, that would be true of every pension fund in the country. So if you can say to them, well, look, as a local authority, if your money's in a private bank, there are two good reasons to have your own public bank or to have it in a public bank. First of all, these bail-ins, which is what this uh, reaching into the bank account, if you like, and turning um, the IOUs, which are the bank owes to its savers into equity, which is essentially what they did, um, could happen here. And in fact, it's exactly what the bank of England suggested should happen here to recapitalise banks. So that's one way of persuading them to do it. Um, that, that putting it into a private bank is actually become an extremely risky thing to do. Uh, and that this would be a safer way of doing that. I think that would be one way of persuading them of the of wisdom of doing it. Um, and that's certainly, I think, legally they could, they could justify it as well within their, their kind of fiduciary remit. Yeah. You talked about geographical mission. Yeah. Um, you know, we even in Ireland and Wales are attracting companies and subsidising companies from yep. international. Yep. And LG, big there. We're looking at how we treat our workers a little better, um, how do we produce things perhaps more locally. Um, I think a, a bank like this can help all of those kind of issues. Um, I mean, these big companies that are coming in, I, I'm never sure how much of an incentive the kind of Welsh grants are because, I mean, if you look at some of the bigger companies, they've got their own financial arm. So if they want to loan, they just lend it off the subsidiary corporation, which is essentially a bank. So, you know. But I, I think the grant system, if you like, this is something that potentially could replace a grant system. And certainly should replace something like Finance World, which is, you know, pretty unsuccessful. Well, the geographical mission doesn't mean that it's going to be worse for us. It's um, not necessarily. I mean, it, 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 if you can show that you, you're going to work 
you know, your company is going to set up here and, you know, there is a possibility of doing that. All of these things, I would say, are things that are up for negotiation and not for me to kind of say at this stage. Mm -hmm. What I'm kind of putting forward here is a, is a really the kind of very basic idea of what a public bank is. Um, and really the kind of meat on the bones of that is something that comes after. Personally, I, I mean, you know, I, I, I think I don't see any problem. I, you know, uh, um, far be it for me to skill people from coming to Wales and welcome people from coming if they want to set up their, uh, their small companies and work here. I think, you know, one of the great strengths of any nation is the ability to attract aid with immigration. Because without that, the race back and can't be for me off. Yeah. Um, I think it's a hugely strong argument for us to have a, a greater developed and more responsive banking system, whether it's at the Welsh level or, or, or locally. Um, that there are lots of problems though with getting that up and going. One of the big yeah. problems is the financial service authority, which now is over responding. No, the potential regulation authority is your having, No, let the cat out of the bag. It's now over responding. And whenever I break this, yeah. people who know a lot more than I do, and they just say, well, you would never get the FSA to uh, to to agree on, on move it forward. Um, so that's so that's one problem. Okay. And the, the other thing about trying to get the um, local authorities say, to put their money into something like this or the trade on the pension funds instead of I've done in the past in Iceland, and of course the local authorities in Mars got an enormous chill many of them around the, the, the Iceland at back. Is this whole thing about the rules around protection funds, etc., about making sure that we're getting the best, yep. right, the best interest, and you know, they don't use the term best value, do they? Uh, unfortunately. So does this require legislative change or what to get over that side of that? I think it's great what you're saying, and, and you know, people, people actually look at this, but there's, those are two big yeah. structural hurdles to overcome. Yeah, ask the first one first, which is the, the, the regulatory. Essentially, what you, you need, obviously, to be regulated as a bank, you need a regulator to accept you, deregulator to accept you. It's no longer the FSA, of course, the Prudential Regulation Authority now. The FSA is now yeah. gone, yeah. and the sad thing is, because they did a wonderful job of regulating. Did they change on the April 1st? Yeah, just 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 for our environment, I think. Yeah. Was, um, now, the the rhetoric coming out of the PRA is that, and, and and generally out of the Bank of England, is they want to increase competition in banking. They want to encourage new start banks. It's going to be kind of hard for them to argue too strenuously against this while trying to maintain that position. First of all. I'm a great believer as well in the, in the power of um, you know uh, popular democracy, popular campaigns. I think if you want to make politicians or, or anybody do anything, I think it's, it's, it's what FDR said once to somebody on, on the campaign trail when he suggested something to him. He said, "Great idea, make me do it." And I think if you get enough people to understand how this works and to really bombard MPs and AMs and councillors and county councillors, you know, with information about it and, and requests for it campaigns, I, I believe these things can be done. In, in terms of chartering a bank and how a bank is chartered, there is a process. And if you can secure capitalisation needed, get people who are fit and proper persons to, to administer the bank, and follow all of those rules, it's going to be very difficult for them to deny it.